What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Champion Secrets Podcast, where we have elite entrepreneurs, athletes, and high performers who I consider champions, so we can all can become champions in our own way. I wanted to welcome in Kyle. Uh, what an incredible human being he is. We've known each other for probably a little over a year now. Kyle's an incredible follower of the Lord. He's a warrior, an incredible husband, father, jujitsu practitioner, entrepreneur, and a world record holder surviving the most chemotherapy. And so I'm just really excited to have this incredible human on, on with us, this incredible champion. <laughs> Whoa, I'm excited to be here. Super grateful, super honored to be here. Thank you for that intro. Absolutely, brother. Well, I, I personally, like selfishly, um, cause I, I know you now and I've kind of get gotten to know you a little bit, but I want to know like how, like you a little bit growing up, take us back a little bit to like Kyle, when he was a kid, I, I got to meet your parents at the new year's party, which was really awesome. But I want to know, like, cause you're just an incredible warrior. I just want to know like what made you who you are today and what was your kind of childhood like? Thanks. Thanks for the kind, encouraging words. Um, I grew up in Oregon and probably just a blue average kid just growing up uh I just recall a lot of cold rainy days and growing up in Oregon it seems like and uh just kind of was uh taken to a, a my parents kind of went to a church for a while that I wasn't I was kind of into it was pretty traditional um it was probably my first introduction to anything it was more of a religious type church Mm. So I, I kind of grew up in that and um, there was a point where I got the opportunity to live in Malaysia for a couple of years when I was eight, let's see, 19 and 20. So that really changed my life. That opened me up to a international type of uh, uh, outlook on, yeah. on things, really changed me from the small town sort of mentality where I grew up. I kind of grew up on on the base of, of Mount Hood in, in Oregon. Okay. And, uh, really, I really got to experience a lot of things. I worked at a resort. I had kind of a, uh, we had an adoptive uncle out there that owned a lot of businesses. He kind of took me under his wing. I went to like a jungle boot camp and just really, just really grew up, really searched uh, my heart a lot, kind of explored the uh, Muslim religion. There's a lot of Muslims around the uh, Buddhism. There's a good number of Buddhists went into the temple, finally read the Bible and Maybe there was some some influence from from my family, but that's that's what that's where the truth really uh, stood out to me. And of course, everybody's got their their ups and downs, but I feel like I I really grew up when I when I finally got out of that small the small town kind of thing, which I really value too. You know, I don't mean to speak against it or anything. I'm very grateful for that. I had a a, a solid you know, a fairly healthy upbringing and things. But I think I really grew up when I, it took me a while, not until I was like 19 or 20, where I, I guess I started to grow up. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel that when you come from that small town, it's a whole different world. And then when you see, I'm sure going to Malaysia and what, what was the purpose of your trip to Malaysia? And like, I can't imagine how much growth came from that after you're like you saying, you're seeing the whole world. <laughs> yeah, it was um my, my, it, so we called him my uncle, but he was an exchange student. He was the first one in our town. I had probably been 15 years, 20 years before that or so. And my my grandparents had taken him in as an exchange student. So we kept in touch with him. And he'd always come kind of visit and say, Kyle, you got to come out to Malaysia. And at that time, this was way back when I'm, I'm older. So there was no internet. We didn't, I didn't know what I was getting into. I got there and I was like, oh, there's, there's actually a hard rack cafe here. There's buildings and I noticed the girls were looking at me a little more. I could go to the the uh, nightclubs out there at, at age eighteen, so it was like a whole unexpected thing. But really, I just I just was pretty immature and went to college out there at age eighteen at Oregon State, mm -hmm. and just uh, just was kind of uh, just was kind of lost. Didn't didn't really have a direction to go. But made it through college and everything. Just super immature and just just. Uh, just needed to grow up <laughs> mm, searching. Yeah. Searching a little bit. You're like, Oh, I need to grow. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah. going, going to college, I feel like so many people think that's your route to growing up, but most of the time it's like, you're staying in that kind of, I mean, for me, if I would have went into college, I feel like I would have been in this immature phase of probably drinking party and doing all the things that are completely against growing up, just almost avoiding growing up. 
<laughs> definitely was doing that. Definitely got got out of a very strict household and let loose way too much. So that was a definitely a factor too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Wow. And so so the the Muslim part, I had no idea about that. Like what who who introduced you or was that something you were searching outside? Like because you you were growing up in kind of a Christian household and so you kind of were searching for something yeah. different out of there. And was that kind of like the first yeah, I, yeah, that's a good, I didn't know what to, at the time I was really searching, I was like, there were some things I, I didn't like about the, what I saw in the churches and the, the Christian religion that I was exposed to, and, and sometimes maybe that's what God leads us to, so it's just not like we're just programmed, we don't feel like we're programmed, I feel like everything was kind of erased, and I was given just a clean slate and free choice, and uh, Malaysia is not... You're, if you're born in Malaysia, there's a lot of pressure. If you're a Malay citizen, there's a lot of pressure. And I think, I'm not sure if it's legal now, but you're you're kind of expected to be a Muslim. You're kind of born, it's it's kind of intertwined with the government. There's a, a big number of population that's Chinese, Malay, uh, you have Indian, Filipino, and things like that. And so they, they're a rare country that has a, a dominant uh, fairly dominant Muslim government, but they allow people to worship that practice Buddhism, Christianity, and things like that. So I was invited. I was around a lot of Muslim people. I'd be at the resorts or be in villages and stuff, and a lot of just great, very kind people invited and into the mosque and, uh, you know, read the Quran, English version of the Quran, and then got in with some Buddhist people and started searching. And And it was uh, the first time I tried, there was a Bible at let's see, I had my Bible with me. I brought it from the United States and, and I finally cracked it open and really, instead of just kind of hearing it at church, read it for the first time. I was in a monsoon and that's that's where I was like, I'm going to read through this whole thing. Let's just let's just see this too. <laughs> Find out for myself. Yeah, because I think for me growing up, I had a similar experience where like, I think with the church, like I was almost portrayed to, it didn't feel like it was my own faith. It was almost just like coming from my parents and coming from the church. And I just felt like, yeah, that same kind of idea where I was just like, at, like after I, like, like you said, after you got into college, you were just kind of searching because you're just like, like you feel like you know what you know, but you don't know it for yourself truly. And so for you to kind of explore a little bit there, and that's almost exactly what I did when I, like I, I started pursuing beach volleyball and I was in the same place, just like, Oh man, like I know this kind of religion that I grew up with, but like, what else is there? The Buddhism, I, I, that's actually the one thing I did. I was like, oh, it's, and that's all like me, me, me kind of interesting thing. And it's like, the Bible is like, no, Jesus, 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 like selfless, selfless, selfless. True. So what was that like transition, like going from, and then, and then, well, I, I don't know, actually when you really, tr after reading the Bible, was that really yeah. where you found your own faith after kind of exploring those so. other? Yeah, it was yeah. really just looking at, you know, it was like I started in Genesis and just went all the way through. And there were some points I was like, ah, you know, it's like going through the numbers and things like that and the lineage. And I didn't have a full understanding yet of how that all fit together and what even what the purpose was of the, the lineage leading up to the birth of Jesus. But once the, once I started to hit certain verses, I, I feel like the word is, you know, it says in the Bible, the word is living and active, sharper than the mm -hmm. double edged sword. It really started to impact me i kept an open heart you know i, I recall praying like hey god if you're you're real re reveal yourself to me in the word and sort of thing and got into proverbs and that kind of blew me away when i got into proverbs ecclesiastes ecclesiastes meaningless meaningless you know it's it's all meaningless i was like whoa i didn't know this was in the bible sort of thing and then you get through psalms and psalms is something it's it, 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 it's just it's been so impactful in my life and going through, you know, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but just going through cancer treatment and stuff, I've relied on Psalms so much because mm -hmm. there's every emotion in there. And it's just that that really rocked me. And then I moved into the New Testament and that was just that was just alive and just wild for me. So that's where I really was like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all in on this. And then when I, you know, it took me some time to really it, get around other other believers and there was some growth to do there but I think that was really it when I when I, I kept myself open to the to the Bible and different things and then I, I searched for the truth and then God is merciful to me to let me see the truth and and then from there it was it was in me <laughs> wow that's powerful that's really neat yeah so so in in Malaysia 
you had your you as you said it was your uncle that kind of took yeah. took you under his wing so That's how long right. were you out there with him was he he was like an, a serial entrepreneur kind of guy and, and exactly he- yeah it was about a year and a half two years or so and yeah he had a he had a company called turnaround managers and they go into different businesses so i got to travel around with him and they, they they go into different businesses and kind of turn the businesses around that were that were broken they buy them and, and things like that and he ended up becoming secretary of, of state in malaysia his goal was to be prime minister but he got uh, multiple sclerosis so it kind of slowed him down a little bit mm-hmm. but really really great guy that that impacted me quite a bit wow that's awesome and so was he i mean that's that's a great experience to be able to kind of be alongside someone who's straight out of college straight out of someone who's being an entrepreneur and actually living and breathing his own business is that kind of where your entrepreneur like mind kind of began or did I that think begin it, with i think yeah you know it, it it impacted me and man talking about this you know this is awesome this is why i love podcast i i haven't given enough credit to that lately i know it did you know, it, it impact me, but I haven't thought of it for a while. It, it, we've started a new business a couple years ago that's done pretty good. And I, I mean, just for being in two years, it's not like we're making millions of dollars or anything, but we're doing we're doing pretty good and it's it's increasing pretty fast. But definitely it set a strong foundation for me. This is the third business that I've owned and 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 definitely he impacted me quite a bit. His his words are that I learned for, for, for business that has stuck with me for a long time. Wow. That's really cool. There's, yeah, there's nothing like that. I think so many people are grown up in, you know, uh, the school, the go get a job, the, until someone really pulls you out and is like, no, there's a different way. Like you don't have to go the same way that everyone else has gone. And so, so yeah, so it's, it's interesting because I kind of, I was lucky. I grew up with my family, both my parents, I was homeschooled. And so both my parents encouraged that entrepreneurial, I like thought and which was awesome, but it was just so rare because every, all my other friends were like, they were grinding to get a job and they're always grinding to do these things. But I was like, no, there's so many other things. There's so many other things that I can do. Yes. And so like from that experience, did you ultimately launch? Cause you said you had three businesses that you started. Yeah. Did you ultimately launch your first business post that? experience out in malaysia it took me a minute to get to that point i what i did is when i came back to oregon i was like no longer for me and i i saved saved up what i could in a few months and i packed uh, the cheap car that i bought and moved to hollywood california i i i don't it was just kind of it wasn't a total whim type of move but it sort of Mm -hmm. was and and i i I had always wanted to live where there there was sunshine and I wanted to give give Hollywood a, a bit of a run. I, I actually went back to school that I uh, got into University of Southern California. Oh wow. And I, I was uh, you know, I I'm a guy who did did a fair amount of college, but and I think there at college can be can be for a lot of people. It I don't think it was for me. I think mm-hmm. I went to it and I I can't say that I really gained much out of college besides the the discipline of going to class. And maybe yeah. there's a couple of things I picked up along the way, but I believe that I, I really grew the most uh, probably outside of college, just living in Hollywood, went to work for a movie screening company and did some personal training on the side. That was my, my first love, wanted to be a boxer. So got into boxing for a little bit and kept getting injured. So the injuries led me into pursuing uh, uh, exercise science, personal training, and and that kind of thing. So the the uh, first business I opened up was a was a sports nutrition store, and then I I moved it into some personal training in a tiny tiny little gym. Wow. So that took me maybe ten years to get to that point of just working as a personal trainer, going to school on the side, just kind of kind of grow, still growing up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Especially because while well, having that experience there with your uncle, he probably was kind of your right hand man. And then moving back to the States and you're like, oh, all right, time to get out of this environment. I'm ready to do something in SoCal. Let's take the Hollywood. <laughs> That's really Plus, cool. The girls weren't looking at me anymore. When I was in Malaysia, I was getting, I had hair back then. And I come back to 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 the United States and I wasn't getting the same kind of I was like what's going on here <laughs> yeah what the heck these ladies aren't looking at me the same way what do I gotta do maybe I'm gonna get ripped like this personal treasure <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing so at at 
Southern California. Is that where you did exercise uh, science yeah, to learn yeah. to learn that? And then you had like a certification to run your personal training business at the same time while you're still correct. learning. Yeah, I went and got sort of different certifications. I've lost touch with all that stuff. What is it, the NSCCA and all those yeah. kinds of things? And got it got different. It depends on what I started at twenty four hour fitness, and then I kind of branched into to some smaller smaller private gym and kind of bounced around a little bit that's awesome what was that life i mean that lifestyle changed from oregon to malaysia to like la like hollywood like yeah yeah i it was i had my moments where i definitely over it was probably lived there eight years and it was probably three or four years into it where i really didn't want to live there anymore the traffic was starting to get to me i moved I tried to make it work and move to the beach. I moved to Long Beach, California. It's a little bit slower pace, but then I drove into the city still. And I had a I had a tough time. There's some great people out there. I had a I had a tough time with a, a large amount of population that moved in, want wanting to be a, a the next big producer, be the next big actor, that sort of thing, and wasn't really wasn't really gelling with a lot, a lot of that. So I got the opportunity to actually move to Wisconsin. That's, I know you're up there right now and, and I uh, took the opportunity and, and that's where I actually opened up the nutrition store and tiny little gym lived there for it's three years or so. <laughs> wow. Long beach. Okay. Yeah. Cause I've seen you guys take some trips as of recently. So long yeah. beach is kind of like a OG spot for you. Cause I, I played when I played beach volleyball, long beach was a big place, Huntington, Hermosa, Redondo. So I spent a lot of time along that coast. <laughs> it's Man, beautiful. You, you were top, you were pretty high level to be going out there and playing. That's I know that that's like the best in the world. That's the Mecca. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For the, for the States that there's, it's interesting. Cause there's so many incredible, like now there's like the Norwegians and they're like the best in the world and they're like 22, but they're like, they don't even come to the, our side of it. Like, world at all they just train in their own little dojo which is the regions how did that happen that i, I I've never i didn't hear that before is it there's a, i know that the regions are pretty tall usually right is that a factor mm-hmm. yeah well the one of the guys his name's andy mole and he's like six nine and he does backflips like this dude's an, a freak athlete and he's like 22 yeah. years old and he, they've taken the beach volleyball especially the men's side by storm like they've they've won like every tournament they won gold lat like it's it's crazy. Like U.S. and Brazil used to be the top dogs, and now all these like Swedish teams and Norwegian teams and all those those teams are starting to take over, which is really interesting. How the game just changes over time. Wow. Yeah, but take me into that move. Move. I mean, that's an interesting move too. You go from Oregon to Malaysia to California to Wisconsin. <laughs> like, what what brought you to yeah. Wisconsin? Was it the business, or was it like fit friends? Or yeah, it's been, let's see. I was I I was in a different. It was a relationship I was in at the time. I was I was married. This is my. I've been married before. Okay. The, the, uh, I'm leaving out some stuff about relationships. It's that's one that's been my my tragic flaw in my life. I've. I've been married uh, a couple times before, and mm-hmm. so I was married at the time, and we both kind of wanted to change, and and uh, I had a, a connection, made a connection up there, and and so did she at a hospital. She was going to work out, so we had been out there a couple times, and and I ended up, uh, uh, I started actually. Uh, there was an accountant I, I had kind of known up there that had a side business nutrition store, and he was really struggling with it. So mm-hmm. I kind of went up there and ended up taking it over and buying it from him. And, and then and there was a big basement there. So we kind of turned that into over time, turned it into a, a gym. But I kind of found out it was kind of like the L.A. thing when I was there. Um, it was a little hard to break in. It was a very small town, even smaller than the town I grew up in, in and call it kind of a college town just outside of La Crosse, Wisconsin. Mm. And it was a lot of, uh, it, it was a slow, slow growth, uh, gr- battling through a lot of, uh, uh, generations of, of thought and things, you know, the, anyways, I'm kind of, kind of falling off. This is where the chemo brain's coming in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> You're great, brother, no, man. <laughs> no, so it, it was a great time. It was a great learning experience. I really prospered because I had the help of my accountant friend on the side, side that taught me a lot about the, the financial part of running a small business. And re- that's, that's such an area I've always been pretty weak in. So he really helped me a lot in that area, which freed me up to focus on the entrepreneurship side of growing the business and learning about how to 
to connect with people and grow and stuff like that. But man, it was cold. I really have a lot of love for Wisconsin. It was a great place, but my my heart was really for a warmer climate. So that's <laughs> when I was searching around, I was going between Hawaii and Arizona. And after visiting both places and researching a little bit, I went with went with Arizona because of the cost of living and the traffic yep. and things like that. You could get a house with a, a pool for a really good price. So mm-hmm. that's where I feel like I I'm claiming Arizona now because that's kind of where I chose where I chose to live. And now I've been here about 12 years. Excellent. Yeah. I I'm the same way. If I were to live anywhere else, it would have to be, it would have to be a warm climate. Like it would either be Texas, like you said, Hawaii, Florida, or Arizona. That's what I've always said. It's like one of those places just because yeah, anywhere else, Texas, man. Texas is cool. Yeah. I'm a fan. I'm in that movement. There seems to be a big movement going in to texas and austin area i'm, I'm all with that <laughs> yeah there's a ton of entrepreneur like that's like the new entrepreneur capital like i have so many friends that are there that are just like crushing it in entrepreneurship and they have like their networking businesses and people are just they're doing a lot of cool stuff out there and i think arizona's kind of the same way too i feel like so many entrepreneurs are starting it's it's kind of like those are starting to be some of the new hubs i think <laughs> yes i agree and so, yeah, so being in Arizona 12 years and you're saying you're getting into boxing and stuff. I'm curious when you got into jujitsu, actually. Yeah, that's it. We're, we're, we're fellow jujitsu athletes. Yeah, we are. Have you been training lately? I have not. I haven't had a ton of time lately, but uh, yeah, I, I feel like when I first started, I've been like two years in and I was training like four or five days a week, super consistent. And then now it's been like a couple months off and I miss it so much. <laughs> well, when you got the little one too, that that can make you that this, changes you know, the world to get, yeah sure. definitely I, no i haven't been i haven't trained myself for coming up on three months now i had to take some time off of the with the chemo and the cancer stuff or whatever but man i love it yeah i've always been into the really wanted to be a boxer grew up wanting to do that and just loved loved mma when the very first ufc did people have been talking about it more now is when it was you had to go get it on on a blockbuster VHS tapes and watching the first UFC and the second one and just being amazed by it and really, really becoming a big UFC fan and kind of keeping up with it, strike force and all that. So it took me a while. I tried a couple different spots and didn't really, didn't really fit me. And, and it was, it was three years ago. It was right. It was in the middle of COVID hmm. and I'd been, I'd been in treatment let's see, I've been, I've been battling coming up on 12 years now. So I've probably spent the first, the first five years. Sorry, we got a little kitty. kitty. Oh, it's all good. That's awesome. I've probably spent the first, the first five years or so, a lot of time in the hospital and really, really trying to learn how to uh, optimize my health so I could counter a lot of the issues that I was facing and not end up in the hospital and relying on, on the hospital and a lot of things to, 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 uh, to get me through it so it was it was uh, you you'd ask jujitsu sorry so it was that mm-hmm. in the middle of covid and everybody was kind of masking up and they were uh they were sorry. dang cats <laughs> dang kitties <laughs> what's up kitties <laughs> everybody was masking up and kind of isolating and i got invited to to the jitsu gym where tim welch coaches and sugar sean o'malley trains mm. and I, and I just something in my heart said, go, go check it out and went there. And Tim was super inviting to me and something said, go in there. And they, they were kind of doing another gym that was you go in the back door during, during COVID and we train and I was kind of looking around. I was like, whoa, should I be doing this with the virus risk and everything with the low immune system? I'd, mm. I'd been, I'd gone to gyms and things and trained, but it really protected myself a lot when I was at the gym and only went when it was less crowded. And in a lot of ways, I, I'd gotten in with a good church and stuff, but I really wasn't tapped into community of people outside of the staff at, that I'd gotten to know really well at the bone marrow transplant unit that mm-hmm. I was staying in, in the hospital. So I just decided, you know, let's go for it. Something in my heart said train. So kind of like you, I went in really hard and I, I just I just started training. I was, I was training probably 14, 15 hours a week, no mass, you know, eyes sweating in, I'd catch a little something. And that's where I really started to, I connected deeply with uh, the people of the gym that are very much like you and, and really uh, 
I think, a, a futuristic and health optimization. Mm. Things like breath work, which I'd kind of dabbled in and out of only when I had pneumonia before, uh, I really learned about how to utilize breath work to boost my my health and my sports performance and learn more about recovery pushing. I really felt called to push my body past limits and not avoid things. And, and my immune system just got stronger and stronger through that whole thing. And I had to go through some things to avoid the COVID shot. I don't want to offend anybody, but I was yeah. very much led to avoid that because when I did get shots and the flu shot and things, my immune system kind of rejected it. So uh, I just fell in love with, with jujitsu and, and did a little M old guy MMA on the side and Heck yeah. I absolutely love everything about it. I love the, I love the entire jujitsu community. The tournaments are just a blast of, never really I don't recall much I don't recall any bad vibes it, it like when everybody gets to together at the tournament so yep. it's all it's all kind of uh uh you know I my favorite my favorite vibe has always been kind of the kind of you kind of you like the I, I you're you're just awesome at beach you know uh <laughs> the kind of volleyball surfer vibe I just that's just my favorite it's just so I, I think that Jesus was a lot like that. I don't know. I love that. Uh, they're just a really, just a, you know, a, a warrior at the heart that, you know, yes. like, like you, you're a warrior, high, high level world elite, you know, pro competitor. And you're also a warrior at the heart. And, but man, that having that, you know, bright outlook, like, Hey, it's all good. I mean, just, God feeds the sparrows and the bird. I'm just, I'm going to glide and I'm going to, I'm going to share optimism. It really, I think it really started to build me into just being more open, connecting with more people, really getting strong bonds and, and family community and just building mm -hmm. out of that. So not, not just the love for the, the actual skill in the jujitsu, which man, I struggle with uh, my I brain and getting these moves down. So frustrating. Right? There's so many things <laughs> happening at one time. <laughs> <laughs> oh man yes the brain doesn't but i love the the warrior part of it the competitiveness there's something so healthy about get to, battling together almost like a dance but you're you're closer and you're both playing a game and you're working the brain and the 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 physical and i think there's you know for me there's a spiritual side to it i'm really i'm really drawn on the lord and things like that and and uh yeah, it's, it, I, I absolutely love sport of jiu-jitsu and, and MMA too. It's just now, now being older and stuff, I got to be, darn it. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're like, man, yeah. I mean, that scary thing with the brain, just getting popped one or the other. I feel like that's just so like, that's the, <laughs> obviously jujitsu is dangerous, but not to that extent. But yeah, I agree. Like there's nothing that has been the same camaraderie that I've gotten to like have with the jujitsu community. Like it's just, and you see these athletes and they lose and they're like, it's not like they're throwing tantrums. When I play beach volleyball, like you see these, these grown men after they lose a match, they're throwing tantrums. It's like, dude, like, are you okay? Like, and you see these guys that are fighting to the death in jujitsu grappling. And they're like, they shake the person's hand. They give them a hug. Yeah. It's like, it's just like, it's all love. And I've never <laughs> experienced that ever. So that's so cool. And for you being such a warrior going through what you've gone through, I'm sure that, I mean, that combined, like, take me into that. Like, how do you, I mean, your journey with, with cancer and chemo and stuff like that, I, th th that just, yeah, take us into that a little Thanks bit. For saying that, a little man. bit. Thanks for saying that. I, I really, I, I would lay in, in the hospital bed a lot. And I try, I always been big on trying to move and more and just an exercise nerd and always about hacking the body. So part of me kind of just it, had to tell my, excuse me, to enjoy the experience because it was like, oh, shoot, we got another bad news report and I got to go through tough chemo and transplant and surgery. Prime guy. We love it. <laughs> yeah. A little prime. I mean, I've been mixing a little element in with the prime. Maybe that's overkill. I don't know. <laughs> Super hydrated. <laughs> yeah. So I'd be laying there and I, I recall being in the hot. I remember very quick. I was laying in the hospital. I forget what year it was. And uh, it was Sugar Sean's contender match with Snoop Dogg. I don't know if you've seen that. Where I saw went. some videos of that. <laughs> And Snoop is like, oh man. And I was like, who? And I heard they're in Arizona. I was like, what? That's crazy. And that that was just like, 
always kind of in the back of my mind, but I'd just, I'd just kind of be there and I'd be just pretending that I was in the, in the boxing ring or I was in the cage. And I, mm. I just watch a lot of fighters, especially I became very deeply into studying the training parts of it and already kind of being in that, my, my first love it how that correlates with the cancer treatment. What can I take from what's what they're doing at the UFC Institute, what they're doing with the Olympic athletes? There's a lot of deep studies, some of the best studies in the white blood cell counts, which is a, a big cornerstone in the immune system have been with Olympic athletes. So what can I take from Olympic athlete warriors? What can I take from, mm -hmm. you know, I think the epitome of, of sports competition when you're, you battling with every limb on your body in MMA, what can I take from that highest level of training? Uh, you know, and what are they doing? What they're growing all the time. I'm watching Sugar Sean now. He's got, you know, over the last few years, he's got uh, gotten to know Dan Garner, sports nutritionist. Oh, yeah. Works with, has worked with Olympic athletes, people from all over top, top level athletes all over the world. Our company works with him uh, to make, you know, we do meal prep. And uh, we we've done Sugar Sean's last last four fight camps, so that's him. Then Brandon Harris, his trainer, one of the best. Yeah, I got coffee athletic. with that dude. That dude's amazing. <laughs> He's so cool, man. We gotta get together. Uh, that he just did a breathwork course at our gym, and uh, we we all gotta get together because man, I really admire your work and and how what you've learned and what you teach in breathwork. So I think there's something there. There's a lot of exciting things going on where my next door uh complimentary business neighbor art of recovery mm -hmm. he uh he he's he's uh we're gonna kind of merge our spaces so we have a oh, breath work wow. area so anyways that the, these types of things like brandon and and uh dan garner and sugar and tim just being such an uh, elite trainer chael son and of of uh of MMA, UF, UFC. That dude's a freak athlete, I too. Him. He's, I'm, but he's just one of my favorite guys. And listen to his podcast, and he's he called uh, Tim the mm -hmm. great one of the great minds of of MMA, and said that it used to be where they trained at Team, team Quest, and even at the age of like 20, Tim was kind of a leader. So he's just he's one of the rare guys that really struggle with with hierarchies and even in ch in churches and stuff. But a guy that he doesn't he doesn't believe what i do in the bible and stuff but he's a guy that god has put me led me to to be okay with being under because he's very against hierarchies and anyways just the so those components together and how encouraging those guys have been to me uh sugar just just getting to know him and tim have become like like family to me our families have gotten together and things and and them just when I've been, we've been in tough times. They've they've helped me out. Hopefully, we've we've been able to to give back and help them out. But just that that the love and the that's in in fighting. Uh, I think that there's something super healthy about it. There's a there's I, I've had to get you got to get down and get dirty sometimes in the cancer battle. Sometimes you're going through stuff that is just beyond. It's I'm relying on God and everything, but I gotta have a fight in there too. Yeah. I gotta. I got to get dig down deep and I got to fight. I got to push through. And it's kind of like you, the same feeling when you're in a jujitsu match and it's four minutes into the match and you're down and you can't breathe and it sweats all over the place. And you, you're trying to go the correlation there just fires me up between the cancer battle and then being able to, to encourage other patients uh, mm. now that I've been in this for so long, I'm in a lot of groups like online. So getting questions or encouraging people or connecting with other patients that, you know, especially when you get called to the, the, the parents of children that are battling cancer. Oh, that's just the, that's the one that I really, the, the such incredible words, the, not just the kids, but the parents that have to suffer through, um going through that there's just some incredible warriors in there that i really think just uh going into kind of what you're talking about is is the fight is just that I, I, you gotta love the training part to be a fighter you gotta love the health optimization and the training so i think that's what what mm. i really take from it that's really cool because yeah your guys's environment that you have there is so tremendous like your guys's meals i've gotten them, my parents get them i 
<laughs> for all my clients, Recharge sure. Center, everybody go check them out. They're the freaking bomb. You guys crush it with the meals. And, and for you guys having that environment of that, like you said, that health optimization, like literally becoming your best self in that health and, and literally pushing, encouraging and having that environment of, of businesses and individuals and and being able to like, hey, I tried this, you should try this, try this out, like, and just like passing those little things of the breathing or the cold plunging or, or, you know, all that training stuff. That's such a cool environment you guys have there. Whenever I go down there, I'm like, this is, you literally can't, don't have to go anywhere. You literally have your food right here. You've got your cold plunge, you got your sauna, and then you got your, your lifting, you got your jujitsu, you got like all that. And so it's so cool how God's led you into that place with all those incredible champions and incredible human beings. And you guys, so with, with that business and with kind of your journey, like you guys have been connected with those people for what, since you've been there, like two, three years. Yeah. It's coming up on three years, I think now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, like you were saying, like, <laughs> I, I can't even imagine having a child go through that, but like you said, the parents that are alongside with them, like that must be, and for you to be in that place, though, because you've gone through so much trials and tribulations through your journey to be able to help those who are just now getting in, getting, you know, diagnoses or things and and like being that mentor for those kind of people, like what's I'm sure that's that's grown you in so many different ways to be almost oh, try to probably get out of like your suffering, even though I can't imagine all, I can't even comprehend, but be able to like meet them where they're like, that's that's so cool. What's um, happening? Okay. Thanks for saying that. It's been, it's been a, a, a ride, the, the cancer treatments. Sometimes it's, I, you know, it's like, you never want to, how do I say this? You know, I wouldn't change anything because it changed who I am. It, it opened mm -hmm. up so many doors. I would have, I would have probably never connected with somebody as awesome as you and got gotten to meet. We had a great time on New Year's, got to know, you know, <laughs> your wife and got to know your I've gotten to know your family and your mom I'm just I'm just yep. so grateful for all this stuff that the very the very first year of treatment I didn't know what I was doing I was always a super healthy guy so to all of a sudden be the sick guy and you know I was I was very much uh into my myself I was I was actually it started the the second business I got into a form of exercise uh, therapy called posture alignment therapy mm. so I got deep deep into that and started to build my career and was working with some professional athletes one was uh, Matt Kane, San Francisco giant and that year he did very well MVP of the world series and pitched a perfect game so that really helped my career I was connecting with a really strong uh, therapist that worked for the Chicago Bears and just it just this was just my kind of my dream to be able to do that I, I mean I really wanted my actually I should say my dream was to work with fighters and I still hadn't worked with a fighter so it took me going through the the cancer stuff to finally be able to be around fighters but really growing that business and then boom cancer hit out of nowhere I was like whoa so blood cancer is Hodgkin's lymphoma to start which is fairly treatable up front it's a very strong chemo at the beginning it's mm -hmm. it's uh it's four chemos together that you lose all your hair, a lot of nausea, you go through all these things. And it's generally six months of that treatment. And then probably 85% of people get cured at that point. So for me, I found the 15% that wasn't cured. And we tried something really strong at the time. And this is my kind of little thing, one of my claims that I try to put out there is I'm world record holder surviving the most chemo and the cancer patient with the largest biceps. Oh, Except yeah. my biceps are getting smaller now. So <laughs> Darn. now I realize I don't want to just add muscle. That's that's not helping my jujitsu game. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so I, so just really uh yeah. I lost my train of thought. I got stuck on biceps. So. No, you're good. And biceps and like you're saying. Bouncing all over. I gotta <laughs> let you steer this. Sorry. No, 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 not at all, man. I love hearing where you're at. This is this is phenomenal. But like you're saying, just like because your ultimate goal was to work with fighters. And that's so cool how God has kind of led your journey like through the highs and lows of it all. Like to get to the point now you are like you are supplying Sugar Sean and all these other incredible athletes at that gym for fuel and stuff. And that's that's so cool. But I know your faith plays a significant role in your life how do you think throughout that journey uh with your relationship with christ as a source of strength and resilience through those highs and lows like what's how i mean is that like i mean and your your wife and your family but um 
yeah everything it's it's everything when when i did it i recall i shared when i first came into reading the bible for the first time hey god are you real well when been kind of a lukewarm christian before that and really really way too much and i still struggle with the pride and being a little bit into myself too much is really just trying to get my biceps big and build my career how much money can i make make sort of thing and and uh i lost my train of thought what was the question so no you're great yeah you're just how how your your faith and your family oh, has, yeah. has played you a significant that. role in yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that must have been the edit, you know. I'm just kidding. I was just see that is my pride and just talking about my myself. But when when I got diagnosed, uh, I was desperate. I was. They told me at the beginning six months to live with without chemo and one year with chemo, sort of thing. Which I don't believe in diagnosis. Only God can hold it. Now I know that Amen. you can't give a a timeline on somebody. But that really that really scared me. I was. It was the last time I was probably I, I go back and forth with fear, but really, really scared. And especially I couldn't get over my boys at the time that were two and three. They wouldn't remember me. And I just mm -hmm. remember thinking, ah, oh, and so I just called. I said, God, if you're real, please show me, do something now. Like, are you real? You know, sort of thing. And yeah, he showed me, led me to somebody that told me, how could I think that I could be a better father than my father in heaven? And that's what I've thought about every day for the last 11, 12 years is when I think, oh, man, how are my my kids going to go without me? This, you know, I just went through about uh, up until last month for three. It was five months of having fevers around the clock. It was getting worse. I could feel it was really battling death. And I kept I just stuck on on that message, message of letting go. But um, it, it just asking God to reveal himself led me into to a group of people that uh an anthem that we didn't we wanted something more they were kind of on the same page as me wanted something more uh we met together in furniture no i love all forms all respect to all kinds of churches but we met in kind of a living room setting and it was more interactive we went really hard with with praise and in worship and that's the first time i like put my arms up and praise and i love yeah. quiet for i love you know dancing around and stuff and <laughs> really really learned the power and the, really the weapon and the the spiritual health benefit of praise and worship so the first year of battle i was just in the hospital just at one point was it was in hospice care uh family coming in to one at a time they could only see me one at a time under big restrictions to say goodbye um and it, just very very sick pneumonia is constantly pcp pneumonia which isn't huge killer for for cancer no white blood cells uh j just all that stuff that you hear about with cancer patients a lot of pain a lot of suffering <clears throat> deep suffering so i'd be in there sometimes just shaking on a bed of ice and trying to get the fevers down and that's when that's when i i really got deep with the who <laughs> Yeah, that's when I got deep with the Lord. That's 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 where the Holy Spirit really, really reveal himself. The realness, the power of God is that when I'm going through through that stuff and death is creeping up on me, the praise and worship. If I I could get the hands up a little bit, I could mm -hmm. I could have somebody play psalms for me and I could soak up that deep praise and worship so that if I could give praise and I could, I could give that to God and stay in that state of praise and worship sometimes for hours that God would create kind of a shield within me so that no matter what I was going through, sometimes it, it'd be, it'd be very difficult. And I'd say, I want out Lord, please take this cup away from me. He would, he would sustain me and just build me in all the joy, the deep well of joy that came through knowing that there's all this, this horrible stuff going around, but but God's joy was there. Oh man, he took me through some joyful places. And it's wonderful when you go through something difficult, like everybody's been sick and, you know, I go through food poison or something. I just went through this thing of five months of being super sick. I wouldn't have been able to do this podcast probably and have the energy to, we, we switched over to another chemo three weeks ago. And man, within two days, the relief in my body was Praise the Lord. <sighs> just so good and then thank you lord like every the food's tasting good the time everything it, i can enjoy it more but it was a lot of pushing now it's just you know it's just it 
you've got God is God is so good. He's he's brought so much relief to my life. And I don't know why he show allows me to stay alive. Um I don't understand those things. Why do you why does a a 12 I've gotten close to family with a 12 year old girl that that passed from from a lot of suffering from brain cancer i don't i don't understand that but also i know god's ways are are beyond my ways and i want to serve a god that i don't fully understand and i know at the end of the day god is doing things that i can't even be begin to understand beyond the scenes and that little girl's family's life and my life that i have no understanding of you know what i mean so i'm just gonna try to do my best imperfectly. Like this morning I woke up and it was the day after chemo and I'd gotten a little, little overly confident. I'm feeling really good this morning, got totally humbled and <clears throat> got hit with nausea. And I was really focusing like, okay, got to hit the breast work. I've got to uh, get my posture right. What mm. am I going to, I got to get everything right physically. I got to kind of make myself move. And I looked in the mirror and I, I just, I saw, ah, you're looking horrible. And a voice was saying, just give up, just go, go lay down. Mm. I just had a, had a, a couple months ago, I had a second cancer melanoma. So went through surgery, had Monday, went through and did some more biopsies and saw the band-aids and just uh, the enemy hit me. And I, you know, I try to push through, you know, I think that part of, of trying, of, of the physical part of it is so very important in health, but I hadn't, I hadn't gone to the spiritual part and and said just give up you're you're gonna die and then it i remembered uh god god gave that to me is that it is is that i i am dead to that kind of thinking mm. that's i'm alive in christ I, amen I, you know what that that part of me is dead now i i don't i don't need that i don't need to go there i'm gonna live forever i'm gonna be alive in christ forever so I, I make that, I take that, that action, I, you know, and it didn't just suddenly be like, ah, and I was yeah. like, you know, that was enough to, you know what, that, that little voice that says you're going to die. That was being squashed out. And then it, it moved into me getting to my boys, driving them to school. And I, I saw a bird flying. I've just been stuck on glide today. That's been like mm. the word is that he feeds them, you know, just, he feeds uh, even the sparrows. And I'm just gonna, I'm just, I'm just gonna glide. And, sometimes it's it's just paying attention and, and being being open but man that that thing is just so deep is that i no longer live but it's christ that lives within me that's that's just that's just everything in my walk i think amen wow that encourages me so much with just the trust that you have there and knowing that the devil's attacking you and knowing that we have you know we have the flesh we have this world and we have the evil one that's always just prowling like an evil lion and we just have to be like you said, aware of that and be like, in the name of Jesus, you are with me and you are in control. And like you said, we have eternal life through his son. And this is just an Airbnb. However long he has us here, we're here and we're gone and we're up there until the ends of, of time, which is beautiful. And this, this discipleship training I went to through this weekend, it opened my eyes to a lot because I think so many people in this day and age, and I'm seeing it through you, is just that there is so much healing and the Lord is in so much control. And he is literally the choir master up there, like controlling everything. And we heard a story of a, of a kid who, who called uh, one of the, cause he was in like Uganda and I think he was in Ethiopia and a bunch of for like 17 weeks. And one of the people that he trained in the di discipleship called him and was like, Hey, I think our, our child is passed. Da, 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 da. Like, and then like, they, they just started praising the Lord and someone went over there and like pray, prayed to the Lord and prayed that he would heal. And the kid came back to life. And it's just like, there's so Yay. much healing in the name of Jesus. If we're truly, like you said, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, there's just so much there. And like you said, you don't know why the Lord keeps you living and breathing. And I don't know why he keeps any of us living and breathing, but he has <laughs> such an incredible plan for each and every one of us. And for you to just surrender in that place knowing that like your brain's telling you all these other things and and to to fix yourself on uh, the presence of the lord is 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 so encouraging and even in those moments like is it is i mean it's it's hard i'm sure no matter what you're like oh i don't i don't want to i don't want to think about the spiritual thing i could do my physical i could do this but like the lord just brings you back huh to to that to that place and being like the full surrender so true so true it's like man when i think i can do it just when i think i can do it on my own and 
get cruising it sometimes it's it's like the the suffering is a paul talks about it a lot the suffering is a gift and it's like man why is how i still struggle with that how is this a gift lord like right now but i do know when things got things got really good for i had about five days where oh man it was the best i've been in probably probably three years and when i really think about those five days I was grateful to the Lord spent a lot of time, but I wasn't really leaning on God like I do when I'm suffering. The, the, the desperation of how do I, Lord, help me? I, I can't. I, this isn't on my own. And, and, that, and I think that was my life before cancer is that I was just really trying to do everything all the time, maybe giving a little shout out to God here and there. But that, that, that life was so much more um uh, had so much more discontentment more probably more anxiety more more depression depressed moments when i've been in in many days of suffering and i'm relying on i'm forced to rely on the lord to to continue living on earth to to be able to build learning health optimization and connect with people is that is is that i have so much more contentment and then anxiety the fear all those things are are, are quenched Wow, that's beautiful. I love that. That's amazing. Oh, the Lord is so good. Take me into what what like some lessons you've learned. Um, I, I guess we'll shift gears kind of I'm curious about your entrepreneurship journey a little bit because we haven't got the chance to talk too much about that. Uh, other than you, you did share kind of your your two businesses, but this one, like with your wife, like where did I mean, obviously, she is w the most incredible like chef ever. We saw that in plain sight on that New Year's Eve day. Um, but what what brought you guys to the time where you guys were beginning that business and, and getting that thing going? Because that that's sure been a blessing, and like we said, to my family's life and so many people. So I'm curious about oh, that man. journey a little bit. Yeah, it's been it's been the time of our lives, definitely. And like with any business, and I, I think it's probably always this way, but one side of me says too, in the times that we live in, it's pretty tough to start a new business, especially from scratch and especially in the food industry. I think there's been some ups and downs in the economy and stuff like that. And I'm no expert on this area at all, but I do feel like it's been harder. There's evidence that there's a lot of evidence. I think that in the last 20 years, it's been harder and harder for a small business to be able to grow and to be able to start and flourish. You look at how the tax, the tax system works for a small business and, and insurance, health insurance and things like that. Those, those make it pretty tough to start a business but not even for a, a long-term small business to continue building their business so i really think it it takes there's there's some shifts in how things will work and i think that honestly i think there's been a you know social social media and stuff gets gets beat up a lot and and i definitely have my my struggles with it but i do think it's given an opportunity for small business to shift and grow and counter some of those issues and attacks on the small business because it, it's another method to to be able to to tap into large groups of people and for for our business we my wife grew up in the philippines in longapo in a, in a small village in longapo and kind of just to, as a kid she had a very very simple means she would play kitchen with shells and Oh, that was wow. her dream. God put it in her heart to to want to cook for people. Her dad taught her at the age of six how to start cooking for for things. And uh, her mom left it at a young age. And she was, I think it was 11 years old. And her dad was very sick and he, he was gone a lot. So she was kind of left in charge of her sister, who was, I think she was four at the time or something. So she had to grow up kind of fast. And she would uh she would go to school and she made it all the way through school and got her sister through school and on the side I think the it's very beautiful here about her community there's a lot of good people that uh helped them out and stuff but she would she had a side hustle where she would cook on the side so she kind of just grew up kind of at the beginning selling mango freeze pops like a popsicle sort of thing and and then it advanced into more types of dishes so to the point of when she was able to start working like at a factory, she would sell the employee stuff. She would, you know, uh, bring food there. So that's, that's always been, 
for her to cook for a lot of people, I think it's kind of in the Filipino culture too, is that cooking for a lot of people, that's just her, her, her passion. So when we got in with the people at the gym, uh, right away, the people started that I was really, really just, I don't know what it was. I went through bone marrow transplants. It's a whole nother area, but, um, bone marrow transplants I got a donor that was a 19 year old guy from Poland and something in that time it almost put my brain back to 19 you go through puberty again and all this kind of crazy stuff and something put me I don't know what it was in my heart but I really started to connect with a lot of the young fighters in the gym and so they come over to our house and you know we'd hang out and then it turned this thing when when guys that we knew would fight we'd have these big parties and they got bigger and bigger of people coming over to watch a fight and Aro gets my wife would get so happy and she'd cook for everybody and then it turned somebody said one day well you guys are spending a lot of money on this let's do a tip jar and then you know so <clears throat> that that kind of gave us the thought huh maybe maybe you could cook so we kept our our day jobs we both worked at the same place it was a, a adult uh disability development agencies where we place uh disabled adults into family homes and integrate them in there and my job was to write um behavior plans for for the members and then i'd pitch them to the government so it worked really good for for me being sick and stuff and she was a licensing facilitator so she licensed the homes for the Mm. members to go go to so we we were at a a gym in peoria with our, our family there, Tim, Tim and Sean's gym. And then uh, an opportunity opened for us to move the gym. So they were kind of looking at moving the gym into the old Arrowhead Mall, original mall. No way. Peoria. <laughs> yeah, that, that used to be the big mall over here. Yeah. And it, but it was, it was pretty much, it was almost done. I mean, it'd been uh, the, all of the spaces in the old mall were just all beat up. There was only one place open that had been open, it's been open for over 20 years, I think now, called Die Hard Gym. Mm. Place so special, these amazing powerlifters. It's churned out all these world champions. And this place hasn't changed. And, and the, the machines are the same in 20 years. And Tim Sparks, the owner, just a great guy, says, I'm never changing these machines. I'll fix them. It's the, the best way, you know, the... And I think he's right. They're, you know, it's just a really gritty gym. It's grunge, uh, old it's school. So great, yeah, so many punches, a hole in the wall. They don't fix it sort of thing. And <laughs> it's just gritty in there. And somehow uh, we thought about moving in there, but uh, our complimentary business partner, Sean Fairchild, he got the idea. He he pitched to the owners to open up a place for pretty cheap, just a 900 square foot space. So he ended up... <clears throat> putting cleaning the place up and putting a recovery center in there with a cold plunge sauna uh compression and red light and so yeah that going and I would go in there every day and I kind of pray and help him out a little bit and when he got it set up I'd go in there and use the facility and and right next door was this open space and it started to come into my mind like could we do this well, let's let's just go for it. It was nine hundred dollars a month, which is not bad. It needed a lot of cleaning up, and also about nine hundred square feet. Yeah, our gym moved into the community a couple months later, and so we just started, kept our day jobs, and didn't really know what we're doing, but started just cooking meals and doing meal drops uh, because we noticed that it was in the generation coming up that drops for clothes and drops for different things drops as in all of a sudden you announce hey at this location there's going to be all of these shoes available and and i got to think and kind of you know maybe we could just keep our day jobs and do little drops so we just announce a drop on instagram and in the complex in the uh place uh, in the uh, old shopping mall hey we're doing a drop on meals and as our gym got in there people would come and buy them and then somebody said hey would you do a meal plan for me? It was one of the jujitsu athletes named yeah. Logan Knott. And uh forget which, he doesn't even go to our gym. He heard about us through Sugar, I think. And anyways, he got our first meal plan going. And that's, the meal plan is something we didn't think about entering into. But that's, I noticed when I started to research, there was a big demand for meal plans. People wanting prepared meals for the week where an athlete could go in and, 
you know, you would get uh, 10 meals for the week and you wouldn't have to think about your meals. It'd be healthy meals. And then sugar came to us. I think he was our second meal plan person. And I was shocked. He was like, would you do my meal plan? I'm like, you want us? Are you sure, dude? Wait, what? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> so for him, that's really where the business started to, to grow because then we, we just put everything into trying to, to make the, the base, base plan for the meal plans of his was, was we work, started working with the nutritionist. We started working with, with uh, Brandon. We started asking, he's so, Tim and Sean are so wise over the years doing this for 10 years and learning what to do for his meal plans. And then started thinking about now, how can I get this to the general population? So I saw a lot of, I researched the other companies, you know, the, I don't know if I did a, an official SWOT analysis, like people say, uh, yeah. you look at this, you know, the threats and all that, but I went out and started researching in the area, looking in Scottsdale, looking in different states. It's so nice. You can just go online and research stuff. Your, yeah. Competitor yeah. research right there. <laughs> yeah. How do, how do they do business going into places in the area, seeing what they did and okay, I like this. I, here's something that I think would be good. So I noticed a lot of places would offer frozen meals. So I thought, you know, it'd be cool if we could do fresh meals and Aro really likes to cook fresh the same day. So that was a, has been a big thing for us is that we'll, we'll get start cooking at 233. We have a staff of five now it's growing up. First, it was just Amazing. her and sometimes me getting yelled at in the kitchen, kind of trying to help her out. But uh, <laughs> She's like, get out of here. I got this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You're like, stick to the marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so she started, we started doing the fresh and, and organic as much as possible, really got researched and asked around, what does organic mean exactly? Because we see it in the stores, but yep. really got into that thread for a while, but decided that I was going to go as whatever organic as possible in terms of being the most fresh, highly nutrient, the most trustable source. So I would mm -hmm. started looking for different uh butcher shops arizona grass-fed farms is really good with us and looking at different places where to get our our produce where to get our meats and things like that and and then uh came up with a plan i saw a lot of places did once a week for their meal plans and i thought well that's a long time you have to freeze your food it stays frozen if we're going to be fresh we're going to need two days so then i came yeah. up with monday and thursday to a little sometimes it's a little hard for people to come in twice a week that are busy but um I think that part of it really has been awesome for the most part. Maybe 90% of people, it seems like they love to come in. And I noticed the Dutch bros uh, concept that I absolutely oh, love in their, yes. branding and their experience. How they love on people. When people come in, I wanted it to be that I'm we're gonna love I'm gonna love on the, the customer as much as I can. I want to get to know who they are. Um, mm -hmm. I want to listen to build that relationship about them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to pour, pour into them the best that I can, because I know if I can do that, I'm going to be blessed by who, who they are and building, forming connections, building, you know, building relationships. And then Instagram has been huge. I learned this from our complimentary business partner. When somebody gets into his, his cold plunge, he posts them onto uh, Instagram and then that person shares it. somebody else sees it. So I love that concept of already established people you know in community on instagram um haven't had as much success on other forms of social media but instagram i think works really good for already established people you know posting our business there and then it helped too because sugar would shout us out people come to visit their podcast on timbo sugar show red hawk recap which have really taken off especially after they've been on joe rogan's uh, podcast and then sugar went on joe rogan and mentioned the recharge center hey yo uh, you're like no way is this your life <laughs> i'm listening to joe Rogan. i can't believe we're mentioned on the rogan show so that really it brought in some new people from outside of the gym and so now our business is it's actually about probably close to 85 percent outside of our our, our community uh, we we do a lot of we'll do drops still for extra meals, but the core of our business is the meal plans out outside, and that's how we. I think Levi Levi Kelly um, mm -hmm. had introduced us, connected us us to to you and your family, and that's one example of you know how it's just been a mutual 
blessing on so many levels of you know just getting to know you guys and 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 then getting feedback from the customers and then just over time now now what we're working on is the next step is to is we got we've gotten into a few gyms and we want to try to get into some corporate businesses and create hubs and different areas but we're doing we're we've we're coming up on two years so we're doing this slowly because we've had some things where somebody told me you pull the lever for the marketing and then your kitchen it's like oh crap the demand is through the roof yeah. Yeah. Shoot, we can't I know. so it's, it's, that's where i've kind of learned that's been a learning experience is to not rush just remind remind ourselves that we've only been open almost two years we were able to leave our day job uh four months four or five months she left first and then i left next and just rely completely on that that income. There was a couple times where we bought a new house during that time. We we actually increased our income from the old job, bought a new house, and then in the, any kind of food industry, there's always going to be a little bit of a decline, kind of like up and down. Yeah, <laughs> had some unexpected, you know, cancer reports and some deep treatments and little challenges. Like every small business, I think it's important to the growth because when you go through those challenge and you get to that point of, oh crap, should we get out of this? Should we hit eject and mm -hmm. get out of this business? I think that's a healthy thought for any business owner. And, and to it's you can't it's hard to embrace that. You can't really embrace that because it's kind of sucks. But for you sure. know to know that to tr to trust the Lord we we really relied on the Lord during that time. Hey if if he wants us to do it, cool. If we have to get rid of everything. Oh, we're going to be happy wherever we are. And we've got a bit good network here and this is family and we help each other. So it's going to be okay. Chill out and just ride that wave of any small, small business, be patient. And I, I think a, a thing that I learned too, is that, is that you got to push those, those limits. I'm a big mm -hmm. believer. In, of course, and like with my health, I will go out and, and, you know, I'll do jujitsu for a couple hours and then, you know, I push that limit and then the, it's sometimes I can do it that day, but it's the next day. How is my body recovering when, when I have a developed kidney disease, stage two kidney disease from the chemo? So that's kind of mm -hmm. an up and down battle in just that area. So how will my body respond the next day? Oh, that was too much. I pushed the limit. I'm going to track everything. Same thing in the business. We push the limits a little bit you know, a little too fast. And then the kitchen, oh crap, we need staff who can work here. You know, we, we hit that lever and push the limits. But I think that, I think that if you don't push the limits and, and take some risks, then growth, growth will never happen. So I do that with my, I learned that with the cancer battle is that I got to push the limits. If I don't push the limits, I'm not going to learn where I am with my body and how to grow and how to resolve these issues. And when I push the limits, all oh, this problem happened, what's the solution? Oh man, I can I can advance my breath work into this area, or I can eat this kind of food right now. This is going to work better for my body. Or hey, I can I can uh, take power naps in this position, static back position. Same thing with the business. So that we we learn we we really been working on you know trying to we want to build, but just to just to okay, be patient. You know you got to make an income still, but keep doing the things that have been working and fine tune mm -hmm. those. And then slowly push those limits. <laughs> mm, yeah, I like that. Because I think so many people get caught up in, oh man, Instagram's working. Maybe we do LinkedIn and we do YouTube and we do this. And we <laughs> yeah. do that. Like, like, I can't even keep up with all that. Like, what? It's oh like man, you're so right there. That that was a temptation <laughs> at the beginning. We wanted to get, I thought I had to have a website up. I thought I had to have the perfect logo. We got to have this place looking brand new and everything like that. If you walk into our facility, sometimes I'm almost... I struggle with being embarrassed a little bit because I'd love for them to boost the place, but it's Logan Paul, one of the Paul brothers walked into our place for Tim and Sugar's podcast said, oh, this place stinks. It's like an enchanted haunted house in here. And, you know, like you walk into this place and the front of it's a little gritty and a little outdated and needs some paint and stuff. But we also feel like now we've got, we've got a, uh, We've got Red Hawk Academy is what they named the gym. We've got sugar training there. We've got athletes coming in from around this around the world sometimes, but really from around the state and the area is, is we have have a couple of days where it's kind of like a private training where we've got UFC athletes, top jiu-jitsu guys, they come in and they're in training. 
they got people for the podcast. We've got, they opened up another gym and, and for, and we got a strong MMA team they're building. And then another business came in there and we had a doctor in there and stuff like that. So now every business is full in that place. It's kind of like a health, a health spot. You walk in there and it's like, you know, I feel like it's a little hidden gym is what I like to think of it. That's my rationale, I guess. No, I agree completely. And like you say, though, like, yeah, it could look better on the outside and all things like that. But man, you what you guys are doing on the inside is the most important thing. Like you guys are building relationships. You're building these incredible meals that people love. And then they're sharing it to everyone they know because they just love the actual product and service that you guys offer versus, yeah, I could like whatever. I mean, places, there's so many places that look real good up in Scottsdale and things, but the actual what's going on inside is like completely not good, you know? And so what you guys are doing there has been, has been every time I go down there, I'm like, this is like one of the coolest places to find. Like you said, like literally you can find anything in this place. You got your gym, you got your jujitsu, you got your cold plunge, you got your food and no matter what it looks like outside. And like you said, like, there's some homeless guys walking around. It don't matter. You got some incredible yes. human beings in there that really care about you and are there to encourage you and help you along your journey wherever you're at. And so it's funny because I grew up in Surprise. So that place is like 15 minutes from where I grew up. It like, makes me think of Sun City. I had a church that I went to in Youngtown. That was probably like five minutes from there. But when I first went there, I was like, really? Is it over there? And then I went over there. I was like, this place is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's amazing, man. Yeah, we've been, uh, thanks for saying that. There's, man, I, I so valued, valued getting to know you over the last year. My, you know, my parents absolutely love you and your family. You just, I'm, I've been very blessed that the, the, the cancer battle, I think, really brought my parents and I closer together. They were, and all my family's from Oregon. So they moved down, started to stay, stay and help out with the boys and things. And, um, you know, uh, uh, there's all sorts of stuff that happen with with the relationships. I never know if that's helpful to talk about or not, or if it gets down to of a negative channel. But in the middle, I was just coming out of bone marrow transplant. This is about six years ago. I was married at the time, and it was uh, it was a rough ride. My parents are helping with the kids. The kids are young. Everything's swirling. Uh, it was it, it was my, we had family to help us with with the finance and, and things, but it was like you just feel like totally helpless and mm. I would almost die. And then I'd, I'd come back to life again. And it just became too much on my wife at the time. So she left suddenly, unexpectedly, really shocked us. And it turned into this big battle where I was accused of, of a lot of stuff, uh, abusing her and the kids, raping her and things like that. So it, going through that with the, the cancer battle, that, that really, uh, that really hurt us quite a bit. And it was, it really, it really took a long time for me to work to, is to try to get stronger in who I was and forgiveness and being patient with people and understanding that, you know, that that's God is working on the other person's life too. And to kind of step back and try to try to grow in that area. But through that whole experience, I wouldn't necessarily, I was that I just didn't have any relationship with my parents before the cancer, but them coming down living with us it built this incredible uh much closer relationship so when that when i had just been out of bone marrow transplant i was very very sick they had said any kind of stress could take my heart out so when that happened my parents were there thank god and my dad came up to me and i i just i got on my knees i was desperate i said i, I will praise you no matter what lord he put his hand on me and said son will be here no matter what through everything and True, true to his word they have they ended up selling their house and they moved down here uh they live yeah. in sun city now their lives have i've watched them grow so much they've grown hugely with the lord my dad is the hoa president and he really helps out a lot of the shut-ins and uh but he's going to visit a, a guy uh the, a hospice care right now that it has cancer and he asked me to pray for him to is for him to say the right words to him to minister mm -hmm. and my mom's in bible study group she was never that social before i think and now they're just they're really flourishing they're five minutes from us they get to see the grandkids so that's been a that's been a huge blessing going going through this as well i think yeah it, having that support that, system not only around you there but them moving taking uprooted from what they're used to and what they love there to be able to be there and be your backbone and be able to support you and through your journey and then and then, like you said, for them to 
not only be selfless and come and support you, but for them to grow through that as well. I'm sure, I mean, as a, as a son to a father, I, I love when I see my parents in seasons of growth, that is like the most fulfilling thing for, for me. And like knowing that you're suffering kind of, and like we say, Paul says suffering produces endurance, like improving character and all these different things. But like that suffering through you produced and the suffering that they experienced through you has produced character and building of them. And that's, that's wild. Cause you would never even see it from that perspective. That's interesting. Man, you just gave me words straight from God. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Beautiful. so cool to see your parents grow in the faith. Cause it just, just like, I mean, I think in my life, I know for me, the things that I've like struggled with and like the really hard times I went through a breakup and I think I was depressed and I wouldn't get out of bed for like a year, like whatever. And I, I know from that time, like that broken heartedness, that Psalm 51, you know, come to me with that broken heart. Like there's, there's nothing like being in that place. I think the Lord just like grabs a hold of us because like, oh, you actually know you need a savior and you're that broken and you're in that place. Like I'm here for that reason. Like, which is just, it's just so eye opening to me. Cause I know my journey was so like in that place. Like I, I grew up kind of in that Christian faith, but then until I really hit that super rock bottom, like to where I really just like, I'm so broken. I would, I almost want to rid myself of my life at this point. I don't know what to do. Then that's when we know we truly need a savior. So I think, yeah, just, just that's, that's just what, what you said just brought me to that. I love that. If it's okay, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions too. There, there's probably going to be some people watching this that, that maybe never don't know, know you or, or don't know you very well. And, and uh, I'm really curious, how did you, how did you get into being a, a high level volleyball player? That's a great question, Kyle. Yeah. So I, um, it was funny. I played baseball, basketball, and golf growing up. <laughs> and like, those are my things. I was all in on those. And I was just like, I'm going to be a pro baseball player. That was like my dream since I was a kid. And when I was a junior in high school, I, at my PE, at my homeschool PE, we played volleyball for like the first time. And I was just like, this sport is so cool. Like, I'm yeah. so, I, this is awesome. Like, I'm like, wait, is it? And everybody was like, oh, this is a girl's sport. Like, you can't play it. Like, no way. And I'm like, no, there, there's there got to be people, like men that play this sport. Like, no joke. And so I, I started like literally riding my bike to the same park at night to be like, all right, is anyone wanting? And I would literally bring my volleyball and hope that people would like ask me to play. And I would literally show up at this park and I started to play a little bit with them. People started inviting me to play. I started to get a little better. And then I signed up for a, it's called an open tournament. And what I thought that was at the time was open gym where it's like, Oh, anybody can come, you can come play, but open is like the highest level. That's like triple A. So it's like a double A triple A open. So I was like signing up for an open tournament and I had no idea about any of the rules or anything. I got destroyed. I don't think I got more than two points in any of my games. And <laughs> And, and I have a couple of buddies that every time I see them, they're like, dude, you're so bad. And I was like, I know. And they're just, like, they're, they're, they're like Christian. All right. They put us in like the C division, which is like the lowest division after like pool play. We played a couple of games. They're like, these guys don't belong here. And I was like, yeah, because I thought this was open gym. It's not open. Like what? Like open gym. That's what I thought. And so I ended up, um, we ended up getting last place in the worst division <laughs> that in that being in that place just gave me this desire of like, I wow. still love this sport and I just love it. And I want to be the best that I can be. And so like, I would drive cross like all the way to Mesa from surprise after school to go play with like the guys that play in Arizona. And I would just like try to figure out, watch videos. I would like, I was trying to call like the, the one like pro here and pick his brain and ask him what I need to do. And everybody's like, Christian, you need to move to California. California is where all the best players are. Da, 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 da. And so I graduated high school and I decided to to move out there. I like sold like whatever I had and was like, oh, I got 3000 bucks. All right. That'll, that'll get me for, for a couple of months out here. And so I go out there and I meet a guy on Instagram and we live together in this like studio apartment and we live right next to the beach in Hermosa beach. And uh, it, there was like, at times there was like four of us in the studio oh, we were yeah, just trying to figure great it out spot man Jeez. <laughs> yeah it was such a blessing and i remember being at the beach from sun up to sundown like 7 a.m we'd get up we'd be at the beach and then we'd be playing all day long just getting burnt sunburnt eating pop tarts eating what it, whatever it took <laughs> to keep us alive throughout the day and uh yeah and then i just kept kept pursuing it and kept i what i would do is i would come back home in arizona i would spend like you know six months there and then I would just like save money, work with my dad doing swimming pools. And I try to like add something to my tool. Oh, now I'm going to learn this, how to work on my mindset. I'm going to work on breathing. And like every year I would come back in the off season and just like work on stuff. And then I'd go out there and like when summer started, like March, move out there for the summer, 
play, try to get better, try to get in better groups. And then I come back. And so that was kind of like my process for, for, and then probably, probably took me four summers. I mean, I, 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 I made a couple professional tournaments my couple years in, but it wasn't like at the highest level. And it took me about four summers to actually play at like the highest level. And so, yeah, it was, it was quite a journey of starting at like a local park here to like literally getting destroyed and then just being like, I love this sport. I'm going to do whatever it takes. <laughs> Did, were you, were you doing like functional training to boost your game and drills and different health optimization outside of that too? Yeah. So I think my first couple of years, I, I was, it was so funny. Cause I think until I got to that, like, place where I started having some pain, like probably from the time I was like 17 to 20, 21, I didn't do any of that. I was just like, Oh, you know, if I just get more volleyball reps and train and train and train and just do the volleyball thing, I'll be good enough. And then my body started hurting. My knees started hurting from all the jumping and my shoulder from hitting. And then that's what kind of opened my eyes to like, Oh my gosh, I need to do this prehab stuff. I need to take care of my body. I need to start lifting. I need to start like doing these things that are actually going to help me. So it took me a couple of years until I hit that pain threshold. And I think sometimes it, that's what it takes for some of us to like, Oh, that's what I need to do. <laughs> man, oh man, that that's incredible. You know, uh, I remember t when I first heard about you, it was through Levi. Levi was, it was a uh, Arizona diamond back and yeah. he's trying to be the first major league baseball player to go into the UFC. So he, he left the diamond backs and now he's, He's taken some time to live in Florida and he's, he's training at a kill cliff fight club and Amazing. he had a little injury in there, but he's coming back from it. And he's got a fight coming up in March, his first amateur fight. So I, his plan is last time I talked to him is to take that fight and then come back out here. He's, he stayed under, he made sure that Tim approved of Tim Welch approved this match and to stay under Tim, who, who has said he believes in Levi that he could going to the UFC so I heard you know he's very Levi we had a podcast going untapped and it's kind of fell off a little bit yeah. but I remember talking to him about you like, oh we got to get this guy on our podcast Levi was like this guy he's like he get, Levi is like he's I put this in the best way possible he's super picky on people like mm -hmm. it, it, it has to be a person that is health optimization that's outside of the box. Like if Levi says good about an athlete, it because it doesn't happen often. So I was like, oh, and he was telling me that this guy's a high end volleyball player, and you know what? He does jujitsu. We we're like, he's like, I can't believe it. We we're like, yeah, <laughs> that's so <laughs> amazing. Jujitsu. How did I get into jujitsu? Yeah, I, it was um, and I, it's funny because I'm gonna have Levi on my podcast. I think on Friday. I'm super what? stoked. I want, yeah, exactly. No I'm super way. stoked to chat with him. Yeah, I didn't even know that, man. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah, yeah. I literally reached out to him. We're gonna we're gonna chat. So I'm stoked. But um, Ooh. yeah, the jujitsu thing. It it was it was kind of right after where I had that kind of depression season that I was kind of talking about, and um, I I was playing volleyball at this like Scottsdale Ranch Park place and my current professor, uh, Jonathan Alvarez, he, his wife plays volleyball and was there. And it was something just on my bucket list. I was like, I want to do some sort of martial arts. It was just like in the back of my head. And he was there at the volleyball course. And he's like, Christian, like I've been seeing your posts. Like, it sounds like you should try like jujitsu or try like some, some striking with me or something. Cause he was an MMA guy. And, um, I was like, you know what? Like, I'm down to try it. Like, because I, I was just in this place of just like darkness and I just wasn't feeling so good. So I was like, you know what? I'm down to try it. And so he literally just invited me to oh, like a weekly. He's like, all right, just come to my house. We'll be in my garage. We'll do some pad stuff and we'll see if you want to get into jujitsu. But we'll start with the pads because most people want to start with the pads. They don't want to get like sweaty all over people and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's probably a better start for me. So we would literally go into his garage and his wife would always say like, you're literally beating the crap out of Christian. Like what the heck for, for probably like three months, I would just like go crazy. Cause I just, I've always like in volleyball, I've always wanted to just push myself. And so like, that was my opportunity to push myself in a way I never even thought was ever possible. And so he just had me in there once a week, we would go, we would do pads. And then at some point he's like, let's try some, let's try some takedowns and let's try some like guard stuff and this stuff. And then, so it was just one-on-one -on -one stuff. And then, and then I got into it and then he's like, all right, start coming to my gym. He gave me a gi and, and I started coming to his gym, but yeah, it was, it was a volleyball to jujitsu kind of <laughs> nice little siphon. <laughs> and that, that's incredible. That's like that, that's for a top for a high level athlete. I'm always impre like super impressed. I love hearing about and studying like the highest level of athletes, especially because I feel like a, I, I much respect to the previous generations and 
man, they, they became good in a different way, maybe, but I believe that the science now, there's just so much science and, and art and data that goes into building athletes and stuff. And for somebody at that level, like I, I, you know, I always think about like a Bo Jackson guy, like he was way ahead of his time as a top oh, yeah. level athlete that could do football and baseball together. And I see, I just have so much admiration for watching Levi and like how he's always ahead of whatever he's doing. He's managed to stay ahead and, and like you too, and to, to be able to be such at a high end to be able to go from, from volleyball and then you, you, and then to a higher level, you did pretty high level jujitsu too, being in tournaments and things like that. To the yeah, point you I did like two of them. Yeah. So you were going yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was all in, man. That sport has changed me from the inside out. Yeah. I'm so thankful for that. I'm, I'm, I try to get my wife to get into it. We, we brought the little one and that, like we were saying before the podcast or maybe in it, I can't remember, but uh, just like how it's a harder when you have a little one and stuff, but we brought her into her little pack and play and I got my wife in a class and she, she, she enjoyed it, but she was just crying the whole class. And I was like, <laughs> all right, we're going to need a babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. my my professor was like oh no it's all good like we need that wow. external pressure like let her cry that, it's gonna be like that at the tournament so just let it rip I, was like, I don't know about that that's hard when you're a parent and it's your kid it's like oh no. yeah you're like <laughs> trying to drill and you're like oh this yeah. isn't gonna work <laughs> yeah. and you have how many how many siblings do you have again two younger brothers yep two younger brothers right mm -hmm. on we got to we've gotten to know your your mom who's the most amazing one of the most amazing uh, unforgettable people that I've ever met and mm -hmm. and I know she has a strong relationship with with the Lord did was she oh how did she become I'm curious to know I never asked her how she became to know the Lord yeah she so she um growing up she didn't really she was kind of in like this Catholic place and her both her parents really didn't they weren't much of parents like they just left money for her and her brother and they just kind of did their own thing and my mom like I think it was pretty close to after she had me that she really was like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing that like there is a God out there. And she like, I, and she, I don't know anything different because I don't know her prior to, to the Lord, but yeah, she came to know the Lord, like pretty, a couple of years into when they, when they had me and just because she's just like, this is crazy, a miracle, like a child. And then, and then I think she had some, like some friends in the Catholic church that she grew up with a little bit that kind of started to pursue the Lord and get into more of a non-denominational space and kind of was like, Hey, Michelle, like, this is something you should look into. And since then she's been, she's been the, the best example for me as a kid growing up as just a prayer warrior and just so reliant on the Lord. And like you said, like, it's, yeah, it's, I'm so lucky to have her and she, for her to homeschool us three boys, like, man, we were the worst. Like, I can't even imagine how hard that would be to keep, like, I was hiding my school books. I was like, you're not going to, I'm not going to do any school. Like, screw that. Like, so that's, that's awesome. Yeah. She, she yeah, always, bro. every time that I talk about you guys, she's like, Oh, I love those people. She's, she's just, yeah. Awesome. She's incredible. Man, your, your two brothers, they play sports too, right? Yep. So uh, Aaron, Aaron is the middle one and he played, he played baseball and then he played volleyball as well. And then Evan, he did dive and he played or he did dive in California for California Baptist. And now he's a musician. So he's, he's on tour actually right now. He just started his one of his first like solo tours and he's going across the country and he's going overseas and he's an incredible musician. So excited for him as well. What does he play? Uh, Kind of like country folk kind of stuff. Oops. Yeah. Yeah, I just noticed my uh, our my wife. She's been on me because my my tongue is blue. Oh yeah, I was gonna say the blue tongue. So it's like I got a, a it looks. She's like, oh, you look like your kid. Like you've been eating some candy or a snow cone or something. But I got way deep into methylene blue lately. Oh. I don't know if you heard of that supplement. I've heard it thrown around a little, but I don't know too much about it. Take me into it. Yeah, yeah. So I first heard about it from Ben Greenfield a couple of years ago, and just kind of kept my my ear to it and probably a couple couple of weeks ago I started messing around with it but the studies have been real strong and one thing that got me the problem is I haven't I keep screwing up like this morning I wasn't I, I was a little too lazy to mix it up and I just dropped the dropper in and I was like oh no Ari's gonna be mad again my tongue is all blue but it's they mix a little bit of it into blood when they do blood transfusions so mm. I was like oh, that took me down a channel of studying like what what it is exactly and it's just such a rare 
I forget how to, I don't want to butcher the science into it, but it's really, it's, I think it's really awesome to go in and just look at how, like what a pure, pure uh, supplement or element, I forget what it is now even, yeah. but it's, it's been awesome. Like, I feel like, and there's always a placebo factor, factor. for sure. I and never everything. want to mess up somebody's, somebody's saying, because I'm, I'm uh, presented over the time. And sometimes I go through phases where I'm like, oh, I really struggle with it, but people are like, oh, I've got this, this remedy and I've got this thing that'll take your cancer out or something like that. And I struggle with that part of it. It's because like, oh man, you, you know, I've been at this forever. Yeah. You know? you're like I've tried everything. <laughs> yeah. it, it, you know, the one I, I hit a lot is, oh, you got to stop having sugar. That's why you're getting cancer. And I'm, you know, I'm like, I, I do, you know, I have my, I've learned over time about sugar and how to, where, where I'm going to, where I'm going to use my sugar in that. But if it's true that sugar caused cancer, then then people that are 90 years old that are eating donuts for breakfast every day, they're going to have cancer too yeah. sort of thing. So and there's so many people that do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I went off on a trail again. I don't know what I was talking about there. No, you, you were talking about the, oh, methylene. the methylene blue. Yeah. So that's, that's been pretty, that's been, that's been a good one because uh, I'm saying that because I feel like over time, my body will be low, low immune system. Mm -hmm. It's just very vulnerable. And I've got a donor immune system. So it means that sometimes my immune system gets over revved and it, it thinks it's going like a skin issue. I had a, a little staph infection I picked up a few months back on the mats. And so mm -hmm. the staph infection, usually you catch it early, hit it with antibiotics and it goes away. But because it's called graft versus host, it went to help uh, thinking it's going to help that with the donor immune system, but it actually hurts it. And then it leads into a bitter infection. So I've learned over time, the immune system isn't black and white. There's so many variables to it. It's incredibly complex. Even the top uh, immune system doctors, immunologists, I think it is, mm -hmm. they say we, we don't kind of like people say about the brain. And I don't know if that's a good correlation, but there's a lot we don't know about it. Yes. It's really hard to get a handle on what actually does boost the immune system. We know the, the, the factors like sleep and stuff, those basic ones. So, of course, I really work hard on trying to get my sleep. How can I optimize sleep? How can I optimize my resting heart rate through things like breath work? Uh, how can I push the limits of exercise to benefit my long-term battle? Mm. Uh, how can I fit it into what treatment I'm on, what kind of amount of cancer I have in my body and all those factors. So I love hacking and testing and writing things down and pretending like I, I'm some kind of scientist or I don't know, but yes. trying to figure this stuff out. So I try stuff over over time and I'm like, ah, I don't know if this made a difference. I can't really tell, but with the methylene blue, I felt like it did. So I've been taking that and there's been some cool studies even on using it in the eyes. It seems to be a really strong correlation with the red light therapy where they found mm -hmm. that using the methylene blue with the red light has a lot of similar similar stuff so if you're using them together it can it can help restore cell damage and stuff like that so that's one where i feel like that i have um i have felt like a boost in things it's just that blue smurf time that's kind of yeah it's kind of silly but no I, I exactly what you say that scientist like life experiment or i'm in that same place i'm like man like checking my sleep with my aura ring oh if i put if i put my blue light glasses on like like two hours before yeah. bed how does that affect uh, my resting heart rate or my breath work before or meditation or yeah doing some vision work or or doing like all these different like little things it's it's so fun because now with like the i mean we can feel the difference for sure. And if you're really in tune, but sometimes if you're taking so many supplements, it's hard to know or doing so many things, it's hard to know what is actually making that slight difference. <laughs> but it's now so with right. the aura ring, it's like, oh, I can oh. see a little bit of data. If I take one thing at a time, I can actually see the, the you know, physiology data versus, yeah, you can see how you feel, but you're actually seeing numbers. I want the aura ring. I got the whoop strap. Right oh, nice. Now. I've been using yeah. that for three or four years back now. It's been pretty solid. The the aura ring. I I've been thinking about trying to say to to go for that one. That's the one that the USC switched over. You I think USC and Major League Baseball were using the Whoop, and I think everybody switched over to the the aura ring now. I think that the that this is what I've just kind of found out from you know just studying stuff. It looks like the algorithms, especially on the sleep and the um uh the uh 
heart rate HRV. variability. Yep. It's a little mm-hmm. bit more accurate. I bet you your heart rate variability is pretty, pretty high, right? When I'm training hard, yeah, it's it's through the roof. I've had some like 200, 250. Ah, yeah. Yeah. It's like crazy. <laughs> Yeah. that's crazy dude yeah. <laughs> especially when i was doing like double triple days in the sand like oh. oh my gosh that would be and as long as i would take care of my recovery and, and have my time and food in between it would be in hydration and stuff but yeah it's, that's always fun to see what that's you can do what you can do Jeez, <laughs> that's wild how, what, what do you do for how, how's your sleep going i know it's hard when you got a, a little one at home is that have you been able to get pretty good sleep scores yeah actually i got my highest score recently it was like a 97 i've never seen more than what? like a 92 on my on my aura ring but no. yeah <laughs> yeah Dude, 97. You're, you're on it man i i bet you the breath work is playing a big that's big, a big part uh, and i actually started doing for a little while um i was a brain performance coach and what i was doing is a lot of neurofeedback i don't know if you've heard of oh, neurofeedback but it's like no, literally I like i don't i want to get into that you put your hand on a hand cradle and basically like it it the thought is is it like sees kind of where your brain neuropathways are kind of at it's not like a diagnose treat or cure or anything but it's like the communications if they're over communicating or under communicating and basically like you get the data and then you can push and place from a computer push the data into your hands that actually go through your nerve endings and supposedly improve and so when i was doing that for a couple months i saw a huge improvement in my sleep along with the breathing and especially now i think the biggest thing is learning to functionally breathe as much subconsciously as i can to where it's like automatic like it's like it's not like the breath work is great like a couple times a day and things but if i can make my breathing patterns consistent with this like cadence diaphragmatically like low and slow and all nasal and like not having my teeth touch and having my tongue at the roof of the mouth like kind of all those things like almost trying to remind myself like as much as possible throughout the day so that it becomes subconscious that I think that's probably been the best thing that is for my sleep hands down. Man, that's inc- where, where do you find the, the neurofeedback? Where can you do something like that? Yeah, I think they have them now in Phoenix. There was a company I was actually working for them. It was called Vitania and they do it for first responders only. Um, yeah. But there are some um, companies that will come to your house and do neurofeedback for you too. I've been thinking about just buying one of the hand cradles and getting into it and just doing it myself. But um, yeah, if you just search neurofeedback near me, um, there, there'll be some, uh, yeah, that could be actually, uh, that's funny. That could be a good thing for you. Cause oh, we, gotta, we definitely okay. got to, we'll have to, you know, I, have you been to art of recovery yet over by, no, show? I've just been to your spot and the, the, Whenever, the we gotta, place. we got to set up a time together to maybe do like a sauna or just, just hang out a little bit there and, yeah. and talk to Sean. Cause we're, we're planning to, cause in our space right now, we're no longer using that as a kitchen there. So we have a, mm. a whole amount of space we're not utilizing. That's where we've kind of got the idea to, to kind of put stuff in together. We'll probably put in one front desk for the entire space and open, open up a wall between us and want to get a, a, a jacuzzi added in there so we can do the hot to the cold and go back and forth and a PMF machine. You, yes. you probably know about those things and maybe get a little bit more red light uh, stations in there because sometimes there's only one in it and that's gotten more and more popular and people wanted to use that for longer periods of time and getting and, and trying to build up. We want a little breath work uh, posture alignment area in there and trying to get, uh, you know, more things. So that, that neurofeedback sounds like a, another tool that would be pretty powerful. I'll have to look, look yes. you know, more yes. about some of this stuff and yeah. getting, some, getting some coaching and tips with you, like maybe even figuring out like, like getting together with Sean and Brandon, cause we really want to get a, a regular thing. We did one Sunday, Brandon mm-hmm. led it and it, doing that stuff with a group I was reminded of how powerful it is to do it in a group and not just doing it on my own all the time I can really push the limits and I can get other perspectives and like everything else you just grow more that way it's so true yeah no with the the neurofeedback and the biofeedback so I don't know if you've seen those uh brain tap machines oh Um, yes it's kind of like those are sweet I've been noticing a lot of cool things like with that um but, oh, what, what I was going to say is the the combination. I've, I've been working with a couple clients um, that are like volleyball players and we do a mental performance. Like it's basically mental performance combined with breath work. And I've seen incredible results. Like the mental performance is basically like, 
like having a vision, knowing where you are, creating that vision and having it like remind yourself of those things every day and having these like mental strategies that actually help you get there and like a Google calendar for discipline and like all these different things in combination with breath work. Like I've seen insane results, like insane results. Like, and then if I can add neurofeedback and biofeedback, I can't even imagine what kind of results we're getting, but both my, uh, my I couple of clients, talk, are, man. Yeah, I, know. I love this it. I get future. nerd out about it all day. Yeah. My, my couple of clients that I work with, they, they've told me like, I, we've been working together for three months and literally it's once a week. And they, one of them is saying like, their anxiety has shifted. They don't have ADHD anymore. They had all these sports psychs and counselors and therapists. And like, this is the only thing that's actually helped them. And then this other gal is like, told me she's making three times the amount of money she's ever made. We don't even talk about money in our sessions at all. And then she's saying this is like, and she's had sports psychs and all these different things and all these people. And she's just like, I've ne- like, this is the, this is my, out of the three decisions. She's like, if I had three things of my best decisions, that would be one of them just working. And it's been three months. And it's just, I feel so blessed to be in the place of like being able to find, combine those two things. Cause I got certified as a mental performance coach and then got certified as the oxygen advantage, like breath coach. And then now I'm just trying to combine them and like them combined is like, it's crazy. Whoa. So you're, are you, you're working for that company? So I was, yeah, I, I kind of, I, I, I got rid of my job recently because I wanted to go all in on my thing, but I was for a little while, yeah. Man, we definitely need to talk. We need to, we need to try to figure out how to draft you into our place, even if it's like just part whatever you can manage for us. Absolutely, that'd, dude, yeah. That would be a huge asset, man. Yeah, that'd be a blast. I can't wait. I can't wait to talk more about all all that getting that set up. Man. I know. Yeah, yeah. I'll be in town after Saturday. 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 I'm flying in Saturday, so I have all next week pretty wide open. So we should schedule something like early next week. Definitely. Yeah. Love it. Let's see what else we got here. We got so many fun things to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I guess with, I mean, facing facing cancer undoubtedly takes a toll, just physically, mentally, and emotionally what strategies would you tell your, you know, I guess if you could go back, like, would you tell yourself now with all the wisdom that you've, you've gathered over that time? Ooh, you know, man, this has been a, let's see. I mean, definitely, definitely relying on the the whole, relying on the Lord more like, you know, that I just needed to, to really let go and surrender myself Mm. try try to i think i really one of the main reasons i struggled so much in the first year is i didn't want to surrender control um just just to god to you know there's one element where it was two things it was me not really standing up and taking responsibility and relying on on medical staff in the hospital and in just anything happened being kind of scared and just going right into the hospital. Like, Oh, I might die if I don't go in there. And if I don't use the exact medicine they say, and, and, and then at the same time, just, it, just being scared to, to let go and, and, you know, do my best and let God take control. And that those, those are some hard things. I, I think there was a lot of worry for me the first year and to really, mm really I, I think there's the, the, the physical components of learning stuff like I stumbled into breath work through the the uh the spirometer uh, uh that you use when you when you get pneumonia I had to I had to get my breath my oxygen there's a point where they said I could get out of the hospital and I got my oxygen up to 90 or something and I was really super low so they were like, if you work on this, you'll get it up faster. I was like, oh, really? You know, let's sign let's, me up. Like, yeah, yeah. So from that, I was like, whoa, I can make my lungs stronger. And I kept getting pneumonias and I would get a little virus and it immediately turned into pneumonia because of the immune system. And I had this reoccurring pneumonia in my body. So I really, that's when I really started experimenting and researching breath work and how to, so that I, I think that relying and, and even growing more and surrendering and just not just using that stuff when I got into trouble or reliance praise and worship so much when I was, when I was in the hospital and desperate Mm. to survive, but also, also, uh, also to just, you know, do that all the time. And then uh, I think that's helped to prevent like the preventative, you were said something earlier about the, the preventative health optimization to really put my time into there. Um, And then also it took me a long time to realize uh, how important it was to stay stay tapped into a community mm. and to to know that 
it, it it gets tough as a cancer patient when it makes you so tired it, it you get so tired just if you're in an aggressive cancer like a blood cancer you're going through treat chemo treatments and things like that it gets pretty tough to go anywhere um mm. i've had a lot of a lot of say you know i can't really travel out of the they're not supposed to go out of, out of town and stuff like that and even sometimes just to go go to the the store or to go down to the gym or to go to go to work and and things like that takes so much energy so sometimes mm -hmm. you're just like why would I do more energy and thus drop my immune system down a little bit and make myself sicker so it was really learning I really try to say hey you know live as healthy as you can push the limits everything in moderation yeah don't you know don't worry the breath work but also also that I I really needed to uh uh put time into lost train of thought <laughs> that's the fourth <laughs> time in here you're great yeah any anyways just the you know just to just to keep just to keep at it the uh the the part of getting in with the the community and being being around yeah. not being a lone soldier it's so easy yeah, i think exactly. in general for you to just like repel and be away and yeah. that's when our brain that's when the devil can attack when we are surrounding ourselves with community it's like there's Such nothing like that liberty. And kind of also realizing too that hey, if I push the limits and I got, I had a consequence from that, um, at first I would push the limits and then get very sick and maybe end up in the hospital. That it, to to not be necessarily afraid of that to really push push the limits within reason and then learn and get better at pushing them limits uh, every time and to just you know keep 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 pushing forward and relying on the god and relying on god i guess <laughs> amen yeah that's really all we can do i love that so i guess now looking forward like what's what's i mean you've you've gone through so much you've accomplished so much you're in a great great um i mean with you being an entrepreneur and what you and era have created is incredible what does 2024 look like for you like what's <laughs> what's the future look that, like yeah i'm excited i i really i feel like we hit a pretty good it's it's been a couple of years. We did some trials for treatment, and the trials are always a, a big risk, and um, they didn't work out. So that that took my health back a little bit. Um, so now, kind of onto something that worked. We knocked out a, a good chunk of the cancer in this very first treatment. Very very grateful to the prayers and grateful to God. So keep this keep this kind of going and gives me more energy to to kind of put in into the business i'd really mm -hmm. like to to get back into uh training jiu-jitsu a little bit more i'd like to sit down with you and and yeah. uh, figure out some things about um really excited about where our business could go because we have the meal meal plan side of the business and i'd like to continue to push to to grow that um where we have a goal to really, instead of trying to do everything ourselves, which happens to everybody that start, I think that starts it, or oh, most yeah. people that start a business, you, sure. if it's just the two of you running or one person running, you got to find somebody to trust and let go. So we're working on that with the kitchen staff. There's two elements of the business, the kitchen staff with a product that's mm -hmm. ours area. And then me with the business side and the marketing and things like that. So to keep, keep pu pushing to, you know, get people that we can trust to, to kind of turn that over to. And I really called it the recharge center because originally we wanted to make it a place not that would be for where you could go and recharge, recharge at the center. And, and I love that really the, the core, the, the true core of it is, is to recharge with Jesus at the center. Oh. But um, so eventually we'd like to do maybe a, a concurrent nonprofit along with it or something like that. We've, I've talked to to a little bit um, to different people um, like Sugar Sean about doing a nonprofit cancer or something like that. So stay staying healthy and getting that going and really kind of merging and working together to to expand uh, Art of Recovery and the Recharge Center to be at the front end of health optimization and and really uh, falling into to futuristic things like you you know you've got going on to really. Uh, find people that can be leaders and to learn from and just to continue to grow, I guess, in that area. 
I love that. That's amazing. Well, we're almost about two hours. I'm going to be conscious of your time. I appreciate the conversation. I thought we had a, I had a blast personally, I and do. I'm sure we'll you talk more. After. Tell I'm fading off a little bit. My, <laughs> so am my I. Brain, I need a brain sun. cap, man. My, yeah, my last, I'm sorry to anybody listening. The last, I, I, I can feel my brain starting to, I appreciate you being patient with me. <laughs> You're the man, Kyle. I love you like a brother. I had a fantastic <laughs> conversation. You, and uh, I hope you all gather a lot because this guy's an incredible human being. And I hope you guys got a lot out of this this chat. And uh, maybe we'll do a round two. Maybe we'll do it in person next time because I think that'll be absolutely uh, incredible. I love that. Yes, sir. Let's make that happen. Yes, well, God bless man. you all. Thank you guys for being here. Take care. And we'll see you next time.